Nobody understands me, you know that? I fucking bust my ass for you guys, and what do I get? You're spooky. Fuck you, man. Fuck you all. I like it spooky. I mean, I got something to say, you know? What do you think this is all about? You think this is a fucking costume? This is a way of life. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh. Hey, what's wrong with you, man? Mm. Show some fucking respect for the dead, will ya? Yeah, welcome to the Sydney Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Gary Hill. With me, as usual, was not last time, but this time for sure. We have a full crew tonight. I'm very excited. Mm-hmm. Su- Suzanne is here. How are you doing? Greetings. How is everybody surviving this weird summer? Man, I hope. I'm loving it. I'm loving 80 degrees in July. It's, it's, uh, I don't know what it is. It's, it's, uh, I, I think global warming is winning, but you know, I'm, I'm going to be dead by the time the, the polar ice caps melt down or something. It's just, uh, <laughs> it sounds selfish, but I'm not sweating through my clothes, and I'm, I'm happy about that. Also with us tonight is Iris. How you doing? Hello, hello. I'm doing grand. So happy not to be melting up here in the PNW. Beautiful. So weird. Yeah, it's very weird. I, I made the comment. That there's a film. I don't know why I love it, but I do love it. I mean, it's probably Salma Hayek uh, called Fool's Russian with her and Matthew Perry, like a romantic comedy. And there's there's a line yeah, that, yeah. that that Matthew Perry's very white parents say in the movie, "The white people are melting." I feel I feel that way around this time of year, but not really now. <laughs> see, you know. <laughs> it, it's very charming if you haven't seen it before. I don't even like those kind of movies, but I watched that one like six or eight times. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I usually we start, you know. By by saying what we've been watching lately, but I, I I gotta say something right now because this is pretty fucking special. Um, the the Majo, what's I I can't pronounce it. Um, there, there's there's a driving in, in in Pennsylvania right now. I think it's the the Majoning driving is called. That was on the verge of their land being taken away from them, and due to to f- f- raw fandom and and massive support from people, and Joe Bob Briggs and Darcy. Uh, they're having a celebratory event as as we're on the li- on the line right now, where they're showing the 35 millimeter print of Smokey and the Bandit, and celebration that the energy firm that was going to buy the land backed out of buying the land, and they're they're able to keep their doors open due, due to uh, private donations from people, and they're able to buy their own land for their 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 drive-in that's been open since 1947. So, wow. the, the drive-in will live on uh, forever and ever, apparently. And I think that's very cool to mention before we start talking about films that we love. Because I just spent a lot of time with the drive-in, but I'd imagine, awesome. yeah, I imagine a lot of folks, a lot of folks did that maybe listen to this, and it's it's an important part of cinema, you know, just going to go watch a movie outside, you know, or maybe not watch a movie well, what's outside. A cinema. I think it's it's an important part of uh, our Americana, you know. It's it's the drive-in. It's where we would watch all the schlock movies. It's and it's. I think it's sad that most of them are going away. Now, there was oh, there was one down here. It was huge. It was like one of those four screeners, and um, the land got bought out because nobody was going to the drive-in. And uh, now it's just a bunch of apartments there, and it's so sad. Yeah, I hope this becomes a trend, too. You know, and there's a lot of ones that are, that are still standing or not doing as well as they can, or even um, the Midway Drive-In, which is closer to me and Suzanne. They, they, I forget which, I think it's Flashback Weekend raises money for them, and they, they raise enough money for them to actually go digital as far as, like, getting rid of the old projectors so they could still live on uh, kind of thing, and... The Midway is still open today, so I hope this becomes a trend with these drive-in theaters and people want to help out. And you know, I never got to have more fun with the adult part of the drive-in. You know that, that my parents used to mix their own Kahlua and bring it to the drive-in. I remember that. Oh there my god! <laughs> I remember. I think one of my first movie experiences where my mom and my dad took me to the drive-in to see the Apple Dumpling Gang rides again. Oh, that's a great movie. <laughs> oh, I, I always get so nostalgic when I watch it because for some reason that memory is just firmly planted in my head. 
That's cool. What's what, what was the what was it paired with? Oh God, I I think that was the first movie, and I was out cold. Uh, it, it, it usually happens that way. That. Well, you literally it usually happens that way. You know, it's like like yeah. like hanging out with My... you. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, I was gonna say you know like memories that I have of the drive-in is as you know teenagers and preteens. Some of them would get in the trunk, and we would drive in and. But once we were past, you know, people would get out of the trunk and it'd be like, you know, 10 of us watching a movie when only four of us paid. You know, ah. It was great. <laughs> oh, yeah, we did that, too, because we had one. There were two of them where I grew up in upstate New York. There was the V and the airport drive-in. And the airport drive-in, on, I think it was like Wednesday nights, you used to do $5 car loads. Do you know how many oh, people yeah. you can fit into a compact car? We got sex. It was a lot lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, there are people in, like, Pintos with, like, 20 people just rolling out. (laughs) (laughs) Like a clown car, so, you know. Oh, hell yeah. Uh, I'll say one thing about a Pinto. Mexicans are very small. I can fit many of them in there, so, you know. (laughs) Oh, man, racism aside. Iris, what you been watching (laughs) lately, girl, you know. Well, I, um, mostly just, uh, TV stuff, you know, um, I'm still going through stuff through the Discovery Channel and, of course, Alone, because that's an awesome show. Uh, but I did watch a movie called Profile, and it is a movie about a journalist who basically pretended to have converted to Muslim, to Islam, and, um, she starts, you know, putting up radical, uh, kind of like ISIS type of uh, videos and stuff sharing on her Facebook profile that she created. And this guy contacted her and basically groomed her, was grooming her to a point of getting her to come to Jordan because, you know, it, it, she was trying to figure out how, how are these guys getting these Western women uh, to go to the Middle East and then, you know, they find they end up being like prostitutes for, you know, ISIS or getting married and just baby machines and stuff like that. And um, if they try to get away, well, they they get killed. They are either stoned to death or just flat out disappear. So she was trying to see how this happens. And it was kind of scary to see how easily she was even herself as a journalist getting sucked in to everything that he was saying. Uh, but because of her, they were able to stop a ring of, I think it was, they, they made 10 arrests of men that were basically getting women from Europe to go to Turkey and then to Syria. And, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry about that. Hold on. Uh, and basically become um, slaves to ISIS. And, I mean, it was pretty eye-opening. I was, I was like, whoa. And then, of course, because I am completely into the Lori Vallow disgustingness that she did of killing her kids with so she could be with some other married guy. Um, the, the Chad Daybell thing. Um, I watched Doomsday Mom on Lifetime. Can't believe I'm actually saying that. <laughs> I want to watch Doomsday watch Mom now. This is like a badass title, you know. Oh, dude, it is. No, no, no. It is such a bad, bad movie because, first of all, Knowing the case, they present her as the victim when she is the mean ass wench. And uh, Chad, who is you know the guy that also murdered, helped murder the kids and bury them, um, it makes him look like you know he was using Mormonism to get into her pants. Uh, it, it it was a travesty, but I did get to watch it because I was like uh, I was curious. And also, I reviewed it with a true crime podcast because we we all watched it. But it's like I saw Big Love. Yeah, Let's do this, man! Come on, yeah. Hey, Big Love has nothing on this bitch. Okay. <laughs> that, that first and the way re- Lifetime presented it. Ugh. That first we talked about, I should have accommodated what you were talking about it, but them motherfuckers need Liam Neeson up in that bitch, you know, to save the the, the harm women of ISIS. Yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's basically all I've watched. You know, I've been so busy at work. Gotcha. What'd you watch, Sue? What about you guys? 
Suzanne, what'd you watch, girl? Oh, hi. Sorry. <laughs> oh, God. Well, it is summer, and you know what su- summertime Sue does in the summer? I watch baseball. I was going <laughs> to yeah. say, she had a long pause. I was going to say mass orgies. Come on now, you know. Oh, baseball. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, now there's there's actually a few movies that I've seen, and there's two of them. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do a, a, a light compare and contrast with. The absolutely abysmal conjuring, the devil made me do it. Oh my God, what a piece of fucking shit movie this is. I hated almost every single frame of the movie. I just did not find any redeeming qualities about it whatsoever. If either of you two have seen it and there is a redeeming quality, would you please share it with me? Oh, hell yes. Are you kidding? I love the to me, okay, first of all, it wasn't a horror flick. It was an action flick, okay? Um, and the way Ed and Lorraine Warren show up to be complete and total badasses. I mean, can you literally see Lorraine doing the things that, <laughs> that she was yeah, doing in this movie for real? I mean, it was exactly. completely outlandish. But That's my problem. But... I loved it, though, because it was just so over the top. And then Ed being, you know, the complete badass that he was in this movie. It was like, damn. At one point, I think I was watching, I was watching the movie here at home. And at one point, I was like, damn, girl, you go. <laughs> <laughs> and then when, when Ed's got that, um, when Ed's fighting, uh, the, you know, the possession, and he has a sledgehammer, and he smashes the, the altar that they have down there. I was like, yeah. Ed. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, I had lots of fun with this movie because I, well, seeing, being that I've watched the other two, uh, I mean, oh, I've I watched all, I watched all of the Conjuring Universe movies. Um, I'd have to say that uh, the second one, the Enfield Ghost, this one, and the Nun are my three favorite because they are just so outlandish and just blah, that um they were great but i don't consider any of them um a horror flick to tell you the truth because it's, it's more kind of like an action thriller than yeah. true horror well, I mean, because I'm it's a pg-13 just... i mean can we please 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 get a horror movie that's an r oh uh, no i just don't think that's ever gonna happen again I just, like I said, I, I I know that Ed and Lorraine were frauds. I almost have to start looking at them as fictional characters now. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah you know, you do. Because I, they, they were frauds. They were peddling, they were peddling the, the fad of the time. And this fad kind of, you know, like it ebbs and wanes, ebbs and wanes. And right now it's it's not, it's at a an ebb because, you know, you've got all these ghost shows and you've got you know ghost hunters saying that particles of dust are orbs coming out of somebody's head and, you know shit like this um so you know it's they it's the thing right now and at the time uh you know being in the 70s that spiritualism was coming back not to the point that it was like the 20s but it was coming back so i think they were basically just peddling what people wanted to hear at the time because think of all the great true stories um the enfield uh amityville the one in connecticut that you know this one here the the devil made me do that one um then there was also the family in i think it was indiana that you know they moved in and there was just things going on you know almost the same as amityville um, oh, Demon House, the one that, yeah, that House, exactly said. right. And then there's the one in Brownstown. I mean, all of these things were happening almost at the same time, so it, it seemed like it was kind of like the cool thing to do was to live in a haunted house. So I think they were just jumping on the bandwagon. And though there are things that Lorraine did predict and say that are kind of like, "Well, dude, how, where'd you pull that shit?" And uh, you know, Ed. <laughs> Ed was certified by, you know, the Catholic Church as one of their layman exorcists. So, I mean, there there was a little bit to it, but I think everybody is just the mythos that we have created around Ed and Lorraine 
is, I think, what a lot of people have a problem with. But that's just my two cents. Uh, and the other one, we actually, I watched the demon murder case, the made-for-TV movie. Ooh. And I actually remember, I remember watching that when it premiered. I am that old. I thought so that was a well-made movie. I mean, back in the day, the TV networks could make really good movies. And this one, I mean, this had Andy freaking Griffith in it. He played the Ed Warren type character. I mean, it was, I honestly, I, I think it just, for me, it just told the story better because I know it's based on a true story. And I mm -hmm. think there, I read the book eons and eons and eons ago, which is why I was so interested in this. But I, if you haven't seen the demon murder case, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. It's not what you're going to expect. And there's a Kevin Bacon in it. So you can't really go wrong with bacon. <laughs> is, is there a bacon boner though in the movie? I don't know. If it's a, this is what Nudie wants to know anyway. If there's a bacon boner in the movie, like in Friday the Thirteenth, you know. Yeah, and we followed it up with uh, Tarantulas, the Deadly Cargo. Okay, I just want to know how the hell they got away with killing off two of my favorite actors in a very short period of time. That was not fucking cool. But also a fun movie. I don't want to tell you who dies, or actually, you're pretty much going to figure it out anyway. Mm -hmm. So I guess the cat's out of the bag. Yes, but uh, Dr. Johnny Fever and Tom Atkins die. Oh, wow. Howard Hessman. Love that guy. I hated that guy. Uh, when I, was, I, hated yeah. that, I hated that guy as a kid because of Flight of the Navigator, because he was that guy in Flight of the Navigator that was like trying to stop shit. You know? uh, he's always going to be Dr. Johnny Fever. Uh, wrong, wrong generation for me. Just that, that, that's where that slight age gap comes in to where oh, yeah. th those WKRP reruns were on TV. I just didn't know where they were going to find them. You know, I, I'm aware of them now, but that's about, that's about it there. You know, <laughs> <laughs> shoddy fever. That's fine. Yeah. And I'm back to baseball and I'm very pissed off at the Cubs for trading Jack Peterson to the fucking Braves. Duh. You suck, Cubs. Well, you got that second part right for sure. That they do, they do suck. They need to get it together. You need to get the power play together, girl. Come We're a second on, half then. team, damn it. <laughs> second, second half. Second half team. Just stop, stop it. <laughs> second half, damn it. <laughs> That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. See, this girl is one of those deniers that says, you know what? And you know, there's a lot of people that, that love the Cubs. You don't, don't blame, don't blame Suzanne. Blame WGN. They they grown a fan base over that long of those years, and you Cubs fans, God bless you. I just can't care anymore about the Cubs or any, or any, any America's pastime, you know. Well, I was bummed when they they sold it, but when the Cubs started their own network. Like, what, it's no more WGN? What the? F no. Well, you lost, you lost the whole fan base there, which is your national fan base. In, oh, you, yeah. You, you, they're they're, they're going to follow them or they're not going to follow them. I thought it was a real stupid move to me. Well, I mean, but you can also, I think every platform has the marquee network. Yeah, but I ain't paying for that shit. Well, it's it's with my sports package I anyway. I don't want to watch them pay to, pay to watch them lose, okay? It's just a... Uh... But I have a really big sports package. Really? How, how big is that sports package? <laughs> oh, God, I got everything. Is it, like, like girthy or is it, like, long? <laughs> Does it dig tunnels? Well, depending as well. on the sport, girthy. <laughs> Does it dig tunnels as, as well break walls? <laughs> <laughs> I can keep this going. I don't know why. I keep this going. <laughs> rolling. He's rolling. I got, I watched a couple of lady centric films. Um, that, that I'll report here. I, I watched Black Widow. And it was it was damn enjoyable. It it suffers from some stuff like being too long. Like we're talking about one of these films, I think could use a little more editing, but too. But if they cut some, I don't even know where you cut stuff out. But if they cut some little stuff here and there, made a clean like two hours. I would have I would have enjoyed it even more. Uh, Scar Joe doing the thing. Um, David Harbour, who you guys may know as the sheriff from Stranger Things, he plays her her father. The the, the Red Patriot, who's a lot of fun with doing a uh, Soviet accent. And, and uh, star of the show, uh, star of Midsummer, uh, and this is a whole different role for her, uh, 
Frances P uh, P Pug or Pug, I, I forgot how you pronounce her, her last name, but she's in, um, she plays the widow's sister in this movie, and they're kicking ass together, and I think this is better than those Wonder Woman films as far as, like, a narrative goes, as far as them not crying through half of the film, it just, uh, strong women kicking ass, and, uh, it's, it's a good time. Did you watch this one yet, Iris? Iris! Hi. Uh no, I'm sorry. You broke up really bad. What, what was the question? Did you watch this one yet? The um, uh, Black Widow? No, no, I have not. I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to, though. Because um, Black Widow was always one of my favorites. So, I will be... In, I mean, it's fucking Scarlett Johansson. Yeah. <laughs> Who doesn't want to watch that? <laughs> I have Pat watched it Saturday morning. Yeah? Did he dig it? Oh, he loved it. You know, Pat. Yeah. It, he really, really, really liked it. I actually, I caught the last five minutes of it. Mm-hmm. I watched some. And of, I, I'm sorry. Oh no, I was going to say. Well, the the I found the Easter egg incredibly interesting. Yeah. Ooh, Easter eggs, right on. Easter eggs. Uh, yeah, exactly. And right. this one, I'm actually going to keep my mouth shut about. I just caught that one. <laughs> um, but yeah, I watched this brand new on Netflix that I can recommend because it's a. Uh, They've been releasing films on there with some some pretty big names, and this one around I've been looking forward to since I seen the original poster art like like five months ago or something. Uh, Gunpowder Milkshake is the movie, and uh, this has Lena Headey in it. This has Angela Bassett in it, and Carla G Gugina is in it. G G Gugino, I'm sorry, I don't want to mess with her, her Italian name. Um, shame on me. Uh, it's, this is a, a film about lady assassins uh, kicking all kinds of ass, and I forgot Paul Giamatti's this movie. Good, how can I forget that? But this is like if if you like John Wick, and you you want to see Angela Bassett hit people, hit people with hammers. Uh, <laughs> come come watch Gunpowder Milkshake. It's it's a great it's a great time, and uh, it's oh, that on, sounds fun. It's on Netflix, y'all, so y'all can check it out. Most of you guys have that, I'm sure. I ditched mine. It got too expensive. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, I couldn't justify the eighteen dollars when I was was barely watching it, so th there's that. But um, yeah, I, yeah, oh, Iris, eighteen bucks. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go for it. Oh no, Iris, I have a question for you. Did you watch the documentary about Nexium or the mini series yes. thing? Yeah, oh, I watched. I watched all of them. Oh yeah, that I was so. It was disgusting, at, wasn't it? Oh my. god. God, and the, he's such a slimy looking dude too. He is. He is. He's. He looks very unkempt and greasy headed, motherfucker. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I just. Know. I, I was because I wanted. To, I was going to text you one night and ask you if you'd seen it because I had just gone through it. And my jaw was on the floor, and I mainly bring this up because did you see what Allison Mack got? Uh yeah. That that was. That, I think that's bullshit. I think that was a travesty. Because, you know, uh, she, as much as she wants to say she didn't know what she was doing, yes, she did. I'm sorry. Well, her initials were on the brand. Exactly. Her initials were on the brand. She knew what she was doing. She loved the power. Because... Oh, yeah. You know, you know Smallville was pretty much done, and nobody else was knocking on her door to say, Hey, how about come on over here? Only because Gary Somebody didn't know. Only, attention. Only because Gary didn't know where she lived. People is all I'll say about that one, you know. <laughs> but, you know she. She was finally getting the attention and the clout that she wanted. She was number two, basically, as much as she would like to say she wasn't. And oh, she, she was. She was oh, rubbing shoulders and, and elbows with. I mean, people. You know, like the sisters from the Seagrams. Um, Legacy. I mean, you know, the, the, these are like extremely influential people. So, yeah, they all knew what they were doing, and the way the way they fell was extremely. I mean, it was very well thought out. And um, there is a Canadian podcast, a CBC, a CBC sponsored podcast. Um, and if you want to just even delve in more into what this gal, the one who blew the whistle on them and, you know, went to the New York Post, 
what she went through and how she did everything that she did. Um, oh, I'll, I'll send you a link to it because it um, that's how I got introduced to Nexium, and then well, I, I just started devouring everything about it. I think I watched three documentaries. Every news article I could get my hands on because I'm like, this is this is just fucked up. It is. It. it, it I mean, it, it should have never happened. But the problem is that we, as a society, as humans, just want to feel that we are part of something so bad that we will put our life at risk to, you know, j- just to have to feel that you're a part of something and to feel that you're important. Oh yeah, and I a lot. I read a bunch of things, um, interviews with Catherine Oxenberg. Trying yeah. to get her daughter out, and she's the one who who started pulling the trigger on it because no one was listening. Well, here, um, it's it's um, Gary. Do you mind if I say what podcast it is? Go for it. Okay, so the podcast is Uncover, and it is season one, and it's called Escaping Nexium. Okay, I think I actually have that bookmarked in my Stitcher. So yeah, uh, check that out because that okay. was just. Ooh. It was just amazing. It really oh, I, was amazing. I, it's like I, I kept. I, I felt like I wanted to take a shower after I was done watching each yeah, episode. Yeah, the guys, I, and everything, and just to think that as women, they would sit there and listen to the most misogynistic um, ideals, but accept them so freely. It, it just kind of blew my mind. And these are. These are educated women. These are women of the world. These are women that, um, independent women, you know, um, but. You know, can I chime in as a, as a male here, you know, it's, 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 I'm just, I'm just going to throw yes, it out here do. that, you know, women, I, I talk to them, you know, and some of them are just bored with life. And I'm sure some of these women, you know, whether, you know, they're just bored or their husbands treat them poorly or they have low self-esteem, or father issues, or whatever it is. I'm sure this seemed right at the time to, to, to go into this thing, you know, bullheaded as they are, you know, just to say, okay, let's do this. Oh. Kind, of, kind of like R. Kelly's women. Yeah, well, R. Kelly's, you know, harm of women uh, across the country. But yeah, children, yes, children. But still, the, the, the these girls... I'm sure, I, I've never seen the paperwork, but I'm sure they've signed something to say that when R. Kelly came to St. Louis... That they, that they were they were gonna suck his dick or something, you know, and they they lived in his ho- the houses and they he he paid them well and he dressed them well and made sure they were well fed, and they probably thought that was a real good life too until he discarded them, and then 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 all bets were off. Yeah, I'm sure you know? they did. You know it, that that part there though reminds me of back in the seventies, the baby groupies, you know, um, the two gals that would follow. Uh, just up and down the Sunset Strip, you know, one of them was 14 and lost their virginity to, I think it was Jimmy Page. Oh, you know, that was Patty and... and Star, Star something. Oh. All right, but you know who I'm talking about, right? So oh, yeah. That, I've read tons of is, books. Yeah, she she had a book that I read that it was just amazing. Um, but, you know, I, I guess it's kind of like expected, which is kind of disgusting in a way. <laughs> You know, I don't know that, you know, these guys can do whatever they want because they have clout. And that's exactly what he was doing. He did whatever he wanted because he had clout. And that's what Allison Mack was doing, too. She knew exactly what she was doing and what she was doing to those women. But to sit there and go, I am so sorry. I was blinded by, you know, what he was saying. And I, I just didn't know exactly what I was doing. And I know I've... It, bullshit. You knew exactly that what was, you were doing. Oh, that was the best acting job she ever had. Maybe, there you go. Maybe in the start. But I'm sure once she got in the mix to where she had some sense of, you know, power in, in whatever that organization is, I, I'm sure she, she mm-hmm. really was feeling like, yeah, I know precisely what's going on now. So oh, I, yeah. Even in the documentary when they were showing footage of her... I said, well, I'm, I just feel so bad because I just don't think she likes me. And it just, it hurts me so bad. I'm like, oh, my God. You are so full of it. See, see now, it, it, this is going to sound insulting to our female audience, but 
you guys are strong women with good heads on your shoulders, but I'd say if I picked 100 out of the crowd, 60% of them are not. And these are the women I'm sure they preyed on that were, were, were you know, yeah. you know, not weak, but, you know, exactly v- vulnerable is a better word than weak, I'd say, to, 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 to what they were doing. Oh, they were seeking out a very specific woman, someone who was... And they all have almost the same story that they were. They felt like they were missing something in life. There was just mm-hmm. something that was not there, and they used this kind of basically the love bombing to, you know, we well, we, you know, you have this place, and this will just make you stronger. But here, pay your money so you can move up to the next level. They went to the yeah, Velvet it, Jones. It was very Scientology almost. They, yeah, they went to the Velvet Jones. I want to be a hoe catalog. You know, um, <laughs> if you guys remember that bit on Saturday Night Live. So you want to be a hoe? Give me my give my brand new book entitled "I Want to Be a Hoe." Oh, it's so funny! But this this isn't funny. The situation here, but um, I'm telling you right now, Allison Mack, Lori Laughlin. I know you've done bad things. If you listen to the show right now, I'd still hit that. Okay. <laughs> just, just, just throwing it out there, you know. I'm I'm a shallow male, you know. But uh, <laughs> I had to say that real low too. So I had to say it real low too, you know. I I, mm-hmm. I I I'm cheap too, you know. You you buy me a two piece of the biscuit, you know. It's it's, it's uh, man. I'll give it up. I don't care, you know. <laughs> I gotta stop. I gotta stop. Stop. <laughs> But tonight we're doing, uh, we're starting, we're starting to, it's probably the very quick, uh, do I look infected July with, with two traditional zombie films about kids who shouldn't be playing in a graveyard. We're doing children shouldn't play with dead things. And we're doing, uh, a true blue classic that I've watched many, many times, uh, Return of the Living Dead from 1985. We'll start this chronologically with children shouldn't play with dead things. Wreck this trailer. This is Alan. He's such a dear boy. Oh, this is Jeffy. He's so full of fun. Oh, this is Anya. Isn't she just the sweetest thing? And this is their new friend, Smedley. They're giving him a party. It's his coming out party. Oh, the children are having such fun. They're laughing and laughing. And it all began here. One foggy winter's evening. July 1971. Oh, he ought to be right. It's party time. It's the shank of the evening. My friend Orville and I are having cocktails in ten minutes at my island cottage. Alan, you're not really going to take that thing back to the cottage. I, Alan, take this body. Yeah, and welcome to it. You deserve everything you're getting. (laughs) There's no business like show business like... And I think, in time, we may get even closer. I'm going to take your scraps and feed them to my dog. Well, that's all right. Just keep a stiff upper lip. <laughs> oh, yes. They had such a wonderful time. They laughed and laughed and laughed. That is, until all those friends dropped in. Then they screamed and screamed.
children had such a lovely time. It's too bad nobody ever told them children shouldn't play with dead things. <laughs> Man, I love Trailer Guy's voice in that fucking trailer. It's so good. It's better than this movie, actually. Um, <laughs> Children Shouldn't Play With Dead Things from 1972 is uh, written and directed by Bob Clark, who's written and directed many different things, different kinds of things. I think that's very interesting. Uh, this is the guy that gave us this movie, uh, his next movie, Death Dream, and Porky's, and Christmas Story, and Black Christmas, and... Oh, what's that one that I saw? Because this isn't his directorial debut. This is uh, his his second film. His first film is a film called She-Man, A Story of Fixation from 1967, which plot synopsis a soldier is forced to take estrogen and wear lingerie when he's blackmailed by a violent transvestite. That's a, that's a something weird video. I'll have to check that out one of these days. <laughs> Um, this movie, though, your, your cheapo plot synopsis is this. Six friends of the theatrical troupe dig up a corpse on an abandoned island to use in a mock satanic rite. It backfires with deadly consequences because zombies. Um, not many big, you know, but the biggest star name is the, your, your lead of the troupe, Alan, Orns, or Alan Orn, Ormsby, who actually co-wrote the movie. But um, a bunch of them are named by their names. Valerie Mamchez is Val. Jeff Gillen is Jeff. Anya Ormsby as Anya. Paul Cronin as Paul. As Paul. Uh, the list goes on and on and on there. But the big name to know is Bob Clark, who this film cost $70,000 to make. I think for the most part it shows up on film, but it could have been cut just a little, edited a little bit more, bit more tightly to make it a better film. Um, Suzanne, thoughts on the movies? I have not seen this movie since I rented it in the early 90s. And, you know, it's, it's one of those, I, I look at it as, I mean, look at the incredible talent that spawned from this movie. But, you know, I, I agree with you on the editing because you have to admit, the one thing about this movie that's really kind of fucked up is the pacing. You know, it's ramped up and exciting, and then it's just these long dialogues, or monologues, actually. I do appreciate the movie. I do. I really enjoy it. Like I said, look at <laughs> Alan Ormsby had a really illustrious writing career. I mean, hell, he, did, he wrote uh, some of the portions of Mulan and I mean, several other things. He had a, quite a career, not to mention Bob Clark. And I actually, I, I'm talking so little about the movie, but there's uh, moving on through some other stuff. Um, Bob Clark actually wanted to remake it, you know, now that he actually could get a little bit more backing. And unfortunately, he died in a car accident before that ever happened, which I honestly, I really would have liked to have seen him update his own movie. I because I, I think he knew the shortcomings. The zombies are great. I mean, some of the monologues are absolutely fucking hilarious when he's talking you set my, you, you dress my sets you're a piece of meat that dresses my sets and i like my meat hanging up in the corner not talking yeah just like little little one line gems like that but it's once again it's just the genius that it, it was involved in it and how far they all came it's it, i have to admit it is still one of the more interesting zombie movies I, I do enjoy it, but I, I see a lot more of the shortcomings. And I swear to God, when they're doing that weird little ritual in some cheap documentary I watched about, oh, God, you could find all kinds of satanic, uh, you, uh, you know, documentaries about Satanism and cults and all of that. And I would swear that little ritual in the cemetery, somebody cut into one of these documentaries is for watching an actual satanic ritual. But it's 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 Bob Clark. It, it's Alan Ormsby. I mean, look at the careers these two had. You know, it's pretty damn amazing. It's fun. I like the, I like the zombies. I can't help it. They're cheap looking. But I think that kind of added to the allure of it. But it's it is it is an enjoyable movie. It's a it's one of the 
it, it's just a really enjoyable zombie movie. I just don't enjoy zombie movies as much as I used to because they don't make them like this era anymore. Cool. Iris. So, um, yeah, first time I watched this movie was on VHS. Uh, it was at a, um, I think it was at a, a party or something. And we, we were all kind of just, you know, just, just doing the usual here, have drinks and stuff. Um, but, uh, I got more interested into the movie than the party. And, um, I thought it was an, uh, uh, to me, this was a great and fun film. Um, I loved the the soliloquy all the time uh, that Alan does. You know, he's just going on and on and just telling these people of how they are. Well, basically, they belong to him. And, you know, the threat of, well, you know, you can walk away. You can walk away. You don't want a paycheck. You go on ahead. You don't want a part in this movie. You go on ahead. He knows that he has them completely by the short hairs and he loves the power. <laughs> I mean, he really does. Um, I have seen this movie quite a few other times. And for me, um, I kind of, um, I kind of enjoy it a little more and more each time. I, I just see different little aspects of it. Like this time I focused more on uh, Val's part and Val is the complete badass in this movie. If you really think about it, she's the one that comes up with the plan. She's the one that basically stands up to Alan and goes, you want to curse Satan? This is how you curse Satan. And, you know, she drops down into the grave and just comes out with just this monologue. This is just, it's, it's great. And she basically is the only strong woman really in this whole thing. There are like you have Anya, who is the the fragile little thing, and um, I can't remember the name of the other gal. Uh, Wasn't Val? Uh, Terry. Terry, yeah, Terry. Uh, you know, so Terry was you know stood up a little bit to him, but even still, he would say, "Look, you're the greenhorn here, okay? So if you want to get somewhere, shut the fuck up. Oh, and you're gonna have to give me a blowjob." <laughs> you know, it's basically what he was telling her. And she didn't stand up to him. So, yeah, um, like I was saying, each time I always find something interesting in this whole thing. And, of course, you know, there's Orville. I love the end of this movie. I mean, because Ellen gets a little creepy with Orville, uh, where he says, you know, and I think we're going to be even closer, you know. And I'm like, or we're going to take this relationship to the next level or something like that. I was like... Oh, so we're going into necromancy and necrophilia. Nice. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I really enjoy this one. I think the problem I have with this movie is is that my, my own personal taste get in the way. Because this is made in 72. This is, you know, end of the 60s, into the early 70s. You know, end of that, end or continuation of that hippie slash bohemian era of that time. And I've never been really big on those people as as a culture. It's not like I oh I, I fucking hate hippies, man. You know, like like Brad Pitt hates, hates hippies, and once upon a time in Hollywood just just beating the fuck out of them. But uh, I don't hate them. It's just the whole idea of this you know bohemian free. You know, let's go make this this. Exp- I don't know if they're making a movie or not. They're just going into to the graveyard to say, hey, you know, I I read this somewhere. It kind of reminds me of that girl. I forget her name in Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That's all into the astrology stuff, and she's really deep into it. Well, th- this guy Alan pr- probably picked up a book somewhere to say, "You know what? I could do necromancy. L- let's go to the graveyard and play for a while, and let's 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 film it. And you know, dress up our friends as as zombies, as like ringers. But little do they know, you know, the 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 body. They go to the extremes where they decide they want to exhume a body." <laughs> And, and play with it for a while, and you know what's going to happen to this movie is that he's going to get his. He just he gets his last, which is a, a problem I have with this film. But it, it is a nice reveal that Orville is waiting for him when he finally gets away. It's it's been a trope that's been used <clears throat> in many many things where you think the you know, the asshole is going to get away, but he doesn't get away, and that's that's the conclusion of this movie, and I I love that. Uh, I do love the wardrobe in this movie. I'm sure it did. I'm sure there was just stuff they had laying around, but you know the the um, 
um, those, uh, look for the words, like vertical line pants that, that he was wearing in this movie. I thought those were pretty awesome. And him just, ta Alan, just talking like he, he believed everything he said, I think really sells this movie for me. Because it was in the hands of somebody else, you know, that sounded like... Like they're trying to be douchey. I mean, he's trying. He's trying real hard to be a douchebag in this movie. And he pulls it off really well to the point of, like, let's let's play with the corpse. Let's do this with the corpse. When I mean, you know you knew this, you knew this is zombie zombie film going in. So you're waiting for the zombies to come, and when they do, they 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 come pretty furious. And we get kind of the same deal in the next one, to where, you know, once stuff starts to happen, it really starts to happen. And I gotta say that uh, the coming out of the ground stuff with the with the with the zombies looks really good for the budget they had. I don't know how they did this. Maybe they like uh probably made like pre pre dug holes in the ground and they came out like halfway or something. Who knows? But it, it looked really good for, for a film like this and the fog machine budget was out of control. That's a that's a lot of money there. Um but like I Iris said the zombies or was Iris or Suzanne probably both of you guys the zombies look good. They have like that that crust on them, like somebody probably put some powder and probably some oatmeal on their face, and you know, say, "Okay, hey, you're a zombie now." And they looked, they looked pretty awesome. And I, I, I gotta say that. And so all these things, uh, maybe enjoy this film. And and I, the the thing I didn't enjoy was, uh, I think the, the a lot of the monologues went a little too long. And it's it's editing. He's he's a young filmmaker at this point, Bob Clark, and I, I was kind of. Hoping for a little better editing, but you gotta you gotta take that into into account that he's a young filmmaker at this point and he doesn't know a whole bunch about editing. But two years later, you'll get a film that I uh, was it two years or four years later you you get Black Christmas and I'm not big on it, but I recognize the skills. You know, let's put it that way. It's just I always give Bob Clark credit for for taking Black Christmas and John Carpenter seeing Black Christmas and just taking that ball and running with it for certain parts of Halloween. And, um... Yeah. Good stuff, man. I, I, I gotta find a couple little factoids about the movie. Uh, the names of the tombstones are names of the various crew members. That's a lot of fun. Um... Ba -ba 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 -ba. <laughs> Film back-to-back -back with Death Dream. Uh, as a two-picture deal. Both were shot in Florida. And several of the ca same cast members are, are used in both films. Uh, do, 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 do. Where are we at here? The rundown old house belonged to a popular local photographer in Coconut Grove, Miami, Florida, where it was, uh, it was filmed. Uh, you don't get zombies until the last part of the film. I think it's kind of perfect because you know they're they're doing a lot of a lot of disrespect of of the of the dead, and when it happens, I think it's I think it's 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 a it's a great thing in this film that the zombies come when the zombies come. Because basically they can't take it no more, so they're gonna go kill all the people in the cemetery. They're not not dead as it is, and so uh, go Bob Clark on that one. Mm, yeah, crazy credits. Director Bob Clark is credited as Benjamin Clark in the opening credits. So if you're looking for Bob Clark in the opening credits, you're not gonna see it. Um, oh my gosh, it's it's good stuff. I, I have fun with this movie. This is only like the second time I've ever seen it. Probably the first time I seen it, I uh, was turned off by like the hippie aspect. Like I said, I'm, I'm not really big on that. But if you look past it, you see just a bunch of douchebags waiting to die and just waiting and waiting. And, like, the more and more you could tell, like you're you're getting upset, the undead are getting upset. Like fuck it, man, we're coming out of the ground. And then you know, chaos ensues, and I think it's it's got a great finale. So uh, I'll kick it back to Suzanne and say, Suzanne, uh, any final thoughts? Oh, yeah, one other thing I've, I've failed to mention is one of my favorite things about this movie, I absolutely loved the graveyard sequence. It just, it, it just really, the lighting, and you just got that, you know, kind of damp and creepy feeling in the way that sometimes the lights would hit on some of the tombstones. It, it just was one of those, and once again, you can see you know, him developing and those were just, I just found those incredibly interesting. And I really do need to kick back 
when I'm not trying to rush around and sit and watch it again. Because it is a really interesting zombie movie. There is a lot to it. I mean, it does have a few shortcomings, but, you know, all in all, you know, ounce for ounce, pound for pound, you really can't do much better than this movie. So I'm at probably yeah, seven and a half. Are we doing one to five? Or yeah, one, one, one to ten. ten. One to ten, I'm sorry. Seven and a half, and that's only because I want to kick back and watch it again with no distraction. Yeah, I got you, babe. Iris. Um, I'm going to give this an eight and a half. I do enjoy this. I, I go back to this as uh, just as often as I do the movie that we're going to discuss next. Um, <laughs> and uh, I forgot to bring up the part where um, Terry, no, it's Anya and Alan are on their way upstairs and to go into the bedroom to, you know, kind of like uh, get themselves into the bedroom and shut the door behind it, everything. Um, and they're coming up and, and the zombies are right there. And, and he basically tosses Anya to them. And I love the look that the zombies give him. It's like, really, dude? Really? <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> when you sit down and watch this again, um, you know, Suzanne, watch that part. And, and focus on the zombies because the zombies give us look like, for fuck's sake, dude, really? <laughs> 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 and then oh. They eat her, you know, of course. <clears throat> but yeah, um, like I said, it's just these, uh, these little nuances in the movie for me is what makes it. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to get the give this an 8.5. Oh, keep in mind, I was watching this at work. On my phone, in between dealing with people. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's that's kind of hard to do. <laughs> yeah, I watched some of it on, you know, the television before I went. And I'm like, oh, I can, I'll just finish it up over here. And, oh, God, it was, I, I'm sure there's a lot of nuance that I miss. Like I said, this is this, I have not seen this since I rented it, as you did, on VHS. So I do really want to kick back and give it, you know, the, you know, lights yeah. off. Beer in hand, and just yeah, go do with it. it. Yeah, do it. Because I think I think you will. Um, you won't think it's a new movie, but you will see things that you you missed, and you're like, oh my god, how did I miss that? Oh yeah, I'm definitely. Do oh, boy, yeah, my well, would you would you, oh, you give it eight point or seven point five? Forget eight point five. Yeah. Um, my my turn. I, I give it a straight eight. I, I have a lot of fun with it. I, I think it did really fine with its budget. That that's one of the biggest things. Like if you're watching the film, you say this looks really crappy. As it will cost seventy grand to make, and I think it looks wonderful for for the writing aspect, from the directing aspect, and from everything. It, it looks wonderful. Um, I can talk about Alan Orms, or, Orms, Ormsby because he um, you talk about his writing credits. He worked in every aspect of the film industry. From the producer to the actor to the director, makeup, but uh, the writing uh, wrote *Deranged*, *Confessions of a Necrophile*. Next, also wrote the *Death Dream* screenplay. Wrote a, a childhood favorite of mine, an HBO staple, *My Bodyguard*. He wrote that. Uh, *Cat People* remake, *Porky's 2*, *Popcorn*, *The Substitute* with 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 Tom Berenger. Um, a lot, lot of good stuff in that mix, and I, I, I gotta say that I can say that unknowingly, I've admired this man through his whole career. <laughs> so there's that. Oh, what one? It was a, I think it was a Wonderful World of Disney movie, not quite human, where Jay Under a Jay Underwood plays Alan Thicke's robot creation son, and I watched it long ago. I haven't watched it in years, but I remember liking it quite a bit. It's kind of like a take on like. Those robot kid movies of the age, robot TV shows of the eighties too, like Daryl and Small Wonder, but not as corny as Small Wonder with with the voice. And um, but yeah, the whole the whole man's catalog. I didn't realize that I enjoyed him that much. So thanks, uh, Mr. Ormsby, you, you're spectacular. And the movie's great. I gotta give it an eight. I gotta give it some love. Uh, I think it's available on DVD and probably not Blu-ray. Um, but you can watch a real nice print of it on Tubi. That's where I watched it with, with, with a few ads. And I, I we, much like in much horror, many horror fans, you can find there a, a quite a treasure trove of stuff on Tubi that you can watch. And 
sometimes better quality than if you paid for it. I remember I watched Cube on Tubi, and the 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 copy I had on Voodoo looked really shitty, but the HD copy on Tubi was awesome. I don't know. I can't explain these things, but you know, go check this out on Tubi. It's there for free, so it's, it's good shit. Uh, next up, we're gonna do uh, another True Blue, Blue Zombie classic. Uh, this is a a show of classics, people from uh, the mid '80s. I remember seeing on an HBO video uh, cassette back in the day. It's Return of the Living Dead. Here's the trailer. In the dark of the night, something strange is going on. That movie, Night of the Living Dead. Sure. They ship those bodies. Well, say hello. The dead have risen from the grave. Mister, there's a hundred of those things out there. How many did you say? A hundred. And now the question is, how do we get them back into the ground? Bert, Frank. We have a little problem. Four left. Ten right. It's all over everything. Stupid asshole. Watch your tongue, boy, if you like this job. Like this job. Science is baffled. And it's a puzzle. Because technically, you're not alive. Why do you eat people? Not people. Brains. Ah! How do you kill something that's already dead? Well, how do I know, Fred? I don't know. Let me think. It's not a bad question, Bert. In that movie, they destroyed the brain to kill him. Is that what they did? The brains, right. Brains. Brains. Military is nervous. Usual crap. The police are confused. Send more cops. It worked in the movie. Well, it ain't working now. Bring the movie line. It's not a bad question, Bert. It's not a bad question, Bert. It's not a bad question, Bert. Do you? The Return of the Living Dead. Yeah. For sure, Living Dead from 1985 is a film that I watched many, many times. Um, it stars a bunch of people that, that I love, including Kulu Gulliger, uh, James Karen, Tom Matthews, Linnea Quigley, Miguel Nunez, John Philbin, who's in many horror films that you may have seen, like like Children of the Corn and maybe The New Kids, the Sean Cunningham film. Uh, Jewel Shepard, who's in a lot of naughty films you may have seen before. Uh, I'm, I'm Lee, Beverly Randolph, who's crazy Republican, but I love you to death, baby. Uh, there's there's more, 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 more. Um, Brian Peckway here's a, a, a pervert, but I'm not going to get into that either. Met most of these people. Mark Venturini I'd never met before because that guy died, unfortunately, in like the, the right after he made Friday Five, I believe. He had a, a disease of some kind that I can't recall what it is. But he didn't live very long. That makes me sad. But your basic plot synopsis is this. Two stooges who work at a medical supply warehouse uh, accidentally open up uh, a, t- a crate, a, a barrel of toxic gas that happens to be Nazi, not Nazi, zombie gas uh, that happens to wake a whole graveyard of of zombies up and turn them into the undead as well, and chaos ensues. I love this movie. I love the first two sequels. Iris, I know you missed the show you're going to be on for for your your BB and BC, but um, you're on this show not talking about it. What do you think of the film, girl? I love this fucking film. Let me tell you how much I love this fucking film. 
I have gone through three DVDs. I am on my fourth DVD of this film because I either have watched it and just left it on run. Um, I can hear the music and know exactly what's going on on screen. My kids love this movie. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, one Christmas, it was a Christmas gift to my daughter because she loves this movie so much. I have the cassette of the soundtrack that I took with me to Italy and it went with me everywhere. I mean, I love this movie. <laughs> it is one of the greatest movies, I think, for me. Um, the zombies are very well made. Um, I love the talking zombie. You know, she wants brains because it hurts. Um, the cute little zombie, you know, in the <laughs> in the basement. I mean, just his voice and everything. Just, I don't know if a zombie can be cute, but to me, he's cute. I forgot to mention the tournament. Alan Troutman, who's a puppeteer, is inside that costume doing all those movements. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, and uh, the characters in this are great. As a matter of fact. <laughs> When I was in high school, uh, <laughs> I used to date a guy that looked exactly like suicide. And one time <laughs> I asked him, dude, because well, he used to get into fights all the time because, you know, we were punks. You know, that's what we did. I was like, dude, what, what would you do if somebody ever pulled a chain? Because he did have a chain. It was a safety pin in his ear. And a chain went to his to something in his nose, uh, and he was like, "Wow, gnarly pain." I was like, "Okay, yeah, we're breaking up. Bye." <laughs> I mean, um, all of this movie this this movie is so nostalgic for me. First of all, but watching it and really looking at the movie itself, I think it's genius. It, it's kind of like maybe like somebody role played this movie almost you know but then again i mean it's it's you've got dan o'bannon who wrote alien right um and um he's directing of course but this is to me this this is the epitome of my generations this is my generation's night of the living dead basically is basically what it is this is the gen xers night of the living dead um because it it just incorporates everything of our teenage lives you've got the punk you've got the you've got trash um and then you've got the girl who hangs out with you know the the the, the crowd uh and then there's the kid who just wants to do the right thing but ends up doing everything wrong <laughs> and you know there's bert <laughs> Uh, and um, Ernie is yeah, Bert and Ernie, yes, <laughs> Bert and Ernie, right? It, 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 I, I, you know, the first time I saw that, I was like, cute. I get that, Bert and Ernie. <laughs> um, and Frank. So, and of course, you know, Frank Odds used to do Bert and Ernie. Um, he was the hands behind. He was a puppeteer. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I don't know. This movie is just too great. It's, it's, it's fun. It's involved. You actually kind of get involved with the characters at least for me i it's kind of like i i have developed a relationship with these characters because to me these would be people i would be friends with you know these are the kind of people that i would have hung out with especially trash oh my god (laughs) so goodness and of course she gets sneaky and dances at the graveyard i mean you know that's where we used to hang out we used to hang out at graveyards you know so um yeah, this this movie for me is is just probably one of the best stompy movies, period, um, for my generation. And uh, just the involvement, the the you have talking zombies, you got zombies running, you've got the zombies, you know, calling for more cops. Uh, <laughs> and then of course you have the military, and in those days, how do you solve everything? Well, with with a fucking nuclear bomb, with a nuclear explosion. That's how you solved everything back then. And that's how you solve this problem here. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, That's me pretty much on this one. Suzanne. Me and my friends uh, snuck into the theater to see this. It's one of those three plexes. 
So we bought tickets for an earlier show for some, I, I can't even remember what tickets we bought. And it was the last night it was playing. It was the late show. So we're like, okay, let's go take a peek. So we snuck in and it had to, I can't remember, but I was mesmerized. This was the one, one of those movies that after I saw this, like I am a horror movie fan for life. I love the soundtrack. I love punk music anyway, but this, I, I'm on my third CD and I accidentally, when I ordered my Shout Factory Blu-ray of, of Return of the Living Dead, they accidentally sent me two. So I kept it because I know one of them is going to wear out. My DVD that I had for ages, finally, it's starting to skip in a few spots. So, you know, I've got backups anyway. <laughs> but this once again that i was god i i am trying i think i was like maybe a freshman in high school or going into my freshman year of high school around that time but this was it this has it it just has everything you've got i mean some pretty damn good gore and there are some scenes that'll just make you laugh out loud it's it, it's rabid weasels <laughs> I've, whenever something weird is going on, I just look at somebody randomly say, you know, it's rabid weasels, right? I've only had one person laugh when I said it, which is, you know, a little, little disappointing, but I pretty much am echoing what Iris said. And once again, this is one of the best compilations of punk music on top of that. Little black flag would have been nice, but that's okay. <laughs> hey, we get the cramps though. I know we do. And that makes me happy. And Sons of Liberty, can't forget about them. Yeah, SOL. Dude, quick story about TSOL. Um, a friend of mine, uh, her, I think it was uh, her brother, had a uh, music studio down in, um, in the Long Beach, Downey area. And she's like, hey, do you want to go down with me to listen to, you know, we can just, you know, some bands will let you just walk in and listen to them. We got to walk in to the studio to watch TSOL practice. Oh my and god. I was I was so fangirl, I couldn't even say a thing. <laughs> and I, I was I just sat there in the corner and it it was like I had seen Jesus. Seriously. It, I, that's all I did. I was I was just like watching them and then they broke, you know, for you know like to take a break. And my friend Vicky looks at me, she goes, Do you want to go talk to them? And I'm like I don't think I can. <laughs> She's like, you're so weird. Come on. <laughs> oh, but yeah, my God. It, it was amazing. You know, I I, um, I think we even got to see uh, Great White practice also. But they were they were a bit bitchy. They really didn't like us being in there. Oh, so they're we pretty were, boys. Come on. They suck. Uh, but yeah, it was just, you know, just just my little TSOL story real quick. But yeah. Oh, my God. That is Wild. I know. It's, it's pretty awesome. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I, I've had that fangirl thing happen a few times. That I, I, I usually I'll just turn bright red. I mean, right down to my ears, my neck. Oh, so yeah. usually, I'm. You can always tell when I'm fangirling at somebody because I am, I'm magenta. <laughs> We'll try fangirling on Lamea Quigley because uh, Mike and I got to do an interview because we did the uh, Horror Queen workout, the horror workout. Oh, you did? Yeah, and we got to uh, we got to uh, interview her. And, you know, I was, you know, asking questions and stuff. And then Mike goes, you know, she, she Iris is trying really hard not to fangirl because she really, really likes you. And she goes, oh, how sweet. And I was like, I was like, oh, my God, how can you fan? I, I was actually fangirling through the microphone because that's what I was doing. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> but, yeah, um, just my few minutes uh, next to fame there. But I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, no, no, no. That was, I I was shocked that I was, that, well, you when you mentioned the soundtrack, like, yeah, you know, you know who I'm talking about. But, yeah, I've always loved, I think the soundtrack is so much a part of the movie. But it this really is, is one one of those movies that I if if you can find a single actual horror fan that cannot say that this is one of the best horror movies ever made, 
I'd be shocked. This is it, what I cannot even come up with a flaw. It's one of those. And what I and I have to admit, the ending it's just so abrupt. You're just sitting there with your jaw on the floor, going, "That's it," and then you see it rain again. And you're like, "Okay, cool, moving on." Exactly. It's it's just it's in my opinion. It's one of the most flawless horror movies I've ever... It's one of the most flawless... Let's skip the horror. One of the most flawlessly put together movies I've ever seen. I've always loved Dan O'Bannon. And there's this really interesting documentary about him and Hodorowsky that we're going to... Doing Dune. Have you ever seen it? Mm -hmm. It is fucking fascinating. I've watched it a couple of times. It's... You just get sucked into this strange little world while they're trying to, you know, make this movie. And that is the Dune I would have loved to have seen. That would have been pretty amazing. Oh, yes, it would have. Like I said, it's this movie is flawless. It's funny. It's and it's bloody as hell. I mean, when he jumps up and takes a chunk out of that guy's head and you see brains and lying on the ground. You're just like, you're not sure if you should be stunned or laughing. So you're kind of laughing because you're kind of shocked. It's it's so incredibly well done. And John Russo also had a hand in the screenplay as well. And you all, everybody knows John Russo from, you know, Romero and The Living Dead. But I could go on for hours about each and every scene in this movie. I love Tar Man in the basement. Thank I you. love the cadaver. And that they pretty much put the pickaxe in. <laughs> uh, the, the butterflies. Oh, yeah, no, the dog. The dog. And, and the, I, the half dog. I, I, I cry a little bit with the split dogs. Come on. Because they, they're crying. They're in pain, obviously. Come on, man. You know? <laughs> I know, but it, it could be rabid weasels. <laughs> Every time I hear Rabbit Weasels, there's a song that Weird Al Yankovic does called Albuquerque. It's like 12 minutes long or something. And there's a part of the song where he's like, I passed the guy on the street. He had weasels all over his face. So you know what I said to that guy with a smile on my face? Hey, you've got weasels on your face. You know, it's just so random. It can't stop laughing, you know. <laughs> Continue. Didn't Frank Zappa have an album called Weasels Ate My Face? Oh, I hope so. <laughs> I think he did. I would Maybe. swear he had... Uh, an album called Weasels Ate My Face and it's just this fi- this cartoon 50s dude with a weasel is a razor eating his face. Yes, yeah, so the the code word of the day is now rabid weasel. Rabid weasels. But yeah, I I I love this movie. I love this movie so much. Oh. Yeah, it is a Frank Zappa. Yeah. Cool. I don't know. I, have one. I gotta look that up now. See. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this movie you have a special relationship, and, and you know you've seen the pictures. I was I, I I've been I've been next to Linnea a couple times over the years. You know, I'm so so jealous. The the, the the last the last time I got to talk to her was a couple months ago, and uh, I ended my day giving her a big old hug after saying, you know, you've always been my Saturday night thing, and it's true. She's been my Saturday night thing so many times over the years. You know, just wa- watching those movies late at night and. Nightmare Sisters and Sorority Babes at the Slime Bowl, Bolorama, so, so many things. Creepazoids. I've been watching her for a lot of years. And one of the greatest myths about this film, if you, you don't know it, the vagina is not a real vagina, people. It, it, is, a, it, it is a merkin. It is a mold that goes over her lady parts because you can't show pubic hair on screen. So th- th- there's that. Um, but her butt looks real cute in that scene, though, so there's that. Just, yeah, it does. Very cute. Um, yeah, the gore is on point. Uh, I, I love everything about it. The, the soundtrack goes so well uh, with the film. Whenever Surfing Dead by the Cramps comes on, I turn the TV up a little bit louder because you got to. Um, oh hell yeah! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a little there's a little nuance to this film that I love. But, you know, just see these big hard asses and. Spider, there's a scene where Spider's crying uncontrollably, and Bert slaps him in the face. <laughs> I can't stop laughing every time that scene comes out. There's certain parts of the film that are really, really funny, and that's one of them. This, this, this punker cr- crying his eyes. He's so slimy. Remember what he said, you know, and he's like, slap, slap, you know. <laughs> um, 
the whole idea of, of, of um, Ernie possibly being a Nazi because he has that Luger and he's listening to, I think, Wagner on the, on, the, on his headphones. and Yeah. Th- th- that whole idea of that is kind of silly, but whatever. Um, I love the relationship between between, uh, between Chuck and Casey, or, or lack thereof. I, I, I always, you know, I messed with her one time on Trioxin Day, which is July 3rd. Uh, that, you know, you should have gave old Chuck a chance. He, he really liked you, you know, <laughs> or something like that, I told her. And she she's a friend on Facebook when she, when she pops up on there. And she responded. It was real sweet. And I've met most of this cast, including including the dead ones, you know. And that poster got lost in a fire, unfortunately. But I, I'm I'm trying to make up for it. And uh, James Karen's really funny Clue Gulliger on my old poster, and I hope I get to meet him again before he, he passes on to the great beyond. On my poster, drew an, uh, a stick figure with an erect penis and a, a word bubble that said, I love trash on it. And um, <laughs> people that have met Clue have gotten upset by these things. I was like, that's just Clue being Clue, man. This old freaking perv, you know. Drawing a stick person with an erect penis, and I thought it was hilarious. I thought it was hilarious. But um, yeah, Alan Troutman as as Tarman is is one of the big MVPs of this film for me. I mean, him doing all the movements and mm-hmm. that that thing always having a smile on his face, like he's having the best time a zombie could ever have, is is a wonderful See, thing. He's cute. He's very cute. Yes. Um, quick notes in the in the in the notes notes here. Uh, Dan O'Bannon actually paid zombie actors extra to eat actual calf brains on screen, and the only way they would do this if he ate if he ate them himself. So and he did. So that's that's commitment for you people. I think that's wow. <laughs> eat the actual calf brains on screen. Um. Some other fun stuff in here. Toby Hooper was the original director of this film. Didn't happen, obviously. Um, Life Force. Life Force. Life Force happened instead. Naked, naked things in the Life Force. I can't tell you much else what happens in that movie. Nice naked things. I remember those naked things in that movie. It just, uh... Oh. I think everybody in that movie was naked. Yeah, Which at some point in time. Some of them looked oh, yeah. like, oh. <laughs> Steve Railsback was naked in that movie. It just, uh... Uh, the original song that Linnea was going to dance to was going to be Nasty Girl by Vanity, but we got a whole other song, and I think it's mem- more memorable to me. It's more like a like a Rocky type song, and tonight tonight we'll make love until we die by the lovely Stacy Q. Yeah, by SSQ. Yeah. What else we got here? There's some other good stuff in here. I, I've seen that work print version. It's just a little extra added stuff to it. Um. If you're looking for a Blu-ray and I need to get mine back again, go get that Stream Factory Super Special Edition. I I, I gotta have it back in my life again. So, if you have an extra copy, you're listening. Oh man, now you're gonna make me feel bad and no 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 no. It's no. I'm, 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 and give me I'm, my ca- spare. I'm calling you. The, you have two. How can you have two? Now we're gonna talk. Now we're definitely gonna talk. Now, now I'm playing. <laughs> Oh my gosh! The lead pipe that Clue Gulliver uses in the movie is actually made of rubber. He initially used a real pipe, but the crew snuck it away from him and replaced it with a rubber one, as Dan O'Bannon was worried about Clue's frequent, angry, and sometimes violent outbursts. <laughs> so <laughs> you might hit somebody with that thing. I don't know. Um, yeah, it's it's just a great film. I I I hate to go into all these facts about the film because there's so many of them that that went into making this film. I think. Miguel Nunez was was homeless when he got cast in this film. They they, uh, they hired him to really? be S- Spider. It's a pretty high, pretty iconic role. Then he would of course play uh oh what's what's the guy in in Friday Five those them damn ancient hunters. I forget the the character's name of that movie, but he plays that guy in Friday Thirteenth Part Five, and you know had a big career after that. So go Miguel Nunez. Um, yeah. Yes. Shit, everything. The, the 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 rain scene in the graveyard where they start coming out of the ground and Trash gets her, her wish of sorts where she's uh a bunch of, a bunch of old men all around me mm-hmm. tearing at my skin or whatever she says. Yeah, that's not like a southern debutante and I apologize for that, but uh Oh so so many good things. <laughs> so many good things. I, I love 
the, the whole idea of that they have enough acid to, to just burn Freddy's eyes, but I feel like they have so much of it they could like burn the whole population. But um What's the li- <laughs> when 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 Ernie and, and and Tina get in the attic area and the whole conversation that he has with them while he's trying to bang through the door is a little bit about it's like, oh, Tina, I broke my arm, and now it's falling completely off, or something like that, he says. I can't stop laughing. There's, there's so many parts that are so funny, either intentionally or unintentionally. Um, it, it's really great. And I, I love William Stout's production design in this movie. Although he's he, one of the most iconic scenes in the trailer and in the movie when the skeleton pops up out of the ground and drops its jaw, he thought it was really sloppy. And... It's become one of the most iconic scenes in anything in the movie, so... Because that's where you get party time kicking in, and people love that song, just like me. And, yeah, so many great things. It has sequels. I, I'm one of those people that enjoy the second one. People think it's stupid, but um, Tom Matthews and James Karen come back in similar but different roles in the movie. Uh, and this involves a little kid, you know, of course, the boy who cried wolf kind of deal, and... I love his his mean friend slash enemy slash person, uh, Michael Jackson zombie. That's those makes people. That's the first thing they point out about that movie, is the Michael Jackson zombie at the end of that movie. It's really stupid, but it's not a reason to hate that movie. And um, oh, the big one, uh, part three, which I like as much as this movie, is uh, stars Melinda Clark, where she becomes a, a zombie girl, uh, a la. You know, like a Romeo and Juliet type thing. They're not supposed to get you together, but the boy, the boy's father works for a military thing that's working with trioxin. So he brings the girlfriend back to life, and Melinda Clark is sexy as fuck, cutting herself up in this movie, looking all nasty and stuff. And man, that's the that's the hottest girl in the franchise right there. I love I love Linnea, but in everything, but I'll I'll make that argument. I will. <laughs> Man, oh man. I don't know. It's close. It's very close. You know, I'm, I'm more closer to Linnea, obviously. It's just, uh, yeah, that's that's hot, man. If you're into that kind of thing. <laughs> 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 and I am. So there you go. Uh, yeah, great soundtrack, great times. Seems like I should have said more about this film because I love it so much. But it's been a part of my life for a very long time. And I've, I've, I've been watching this since I started watching horror films. I've had this conversation before where I didn't watch a lot of them because I was a little bitch, but this is one of the first ones that I ever saw. And uh, it stuck with me for this long, and I've owned multiple editions just like Iris. I I bought the trash cover of the thing because I had to have the trash cover of it. You know, I bought Hell you know yeah. the same DVD over and over again, literally, because I had to get had the trash cover because I knew that existed then. And, uh, yeah, I love it. I love it so much. Suzanne, final thoughts, girl. Uh, like I said, this movie is it, it's flawless. It and once again, it, it is that one movie that resonates through the horror community. We all have a deep love for this movie in every single area. Um, <laughs> and just a random side thought: the only thing I really truly remember about Part Two was that. Decapitated head scream. Would you get that damn screwdriver out of my head? Oh, so funny though. <laughs> That's the only thing I remember. It's so it's so like Geraldine racist, but it's so funny. Oh yeah, but this is one that gets a straight up solid, no questions asked, ten for perfection. Cool, Iris. Well, it's it's another. It's, it's going to get a ten for me too. I mean this. Kind of like with you, this movie has been a part of my life, but it's been a part of my kid's life. I cannot wait to introduce Victor to this um, and to be able to say, hey, you know, your grandma's talked to that cutie right there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and she said mm-hmm. I was sweet. That's right. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> but yeah, and, and yeah, I got to see this in the movie theater. Um and that was at the time when you can sit in the movie theater and you'd sit there all day. Nobody would say, hey, you got to go. Right. Um, my parents took me to go see this movie. We just on the random would, you know, just go to the movie theater because it was a dollar and it was cool in there and it was hot. 
Uh, <laughs> and they actually sat through and they kind of liked it because then we went with my cousins and then we went again with another set of cousins. So, yeah, you know, even even my parents liked the movie. So that's saying something. <laughs> but, yeah, this is a straight 10 for me, not just because it's just perfection and all, but it's it just has every element that I enjoy in the movie. It's got the music. It's got fun characters. It's got gore. It's got funny. It's got irony. It, it's... It's just this lovely wrapped up gift of a movie. And yeah, it's a 10. I love, I love the stuff, you know, the little stuff in the film, like I mentioned before. One of the things I've got to mention though, is when Bert, I mean, when, 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 uh, shoot. What's James Cameron? Frank? Frank, when Frank and Freddie are dying, literally dying with, with the paramedics there, they're, they're screaming when they touch them. That is attention to detail. You don't get in many movies because, they mentioned their temperature. They mentioned that um, Ernie mentions that rigor mortis has set in because he's seen it as as a as a as a as a as a, an, as a person who works in a mortuary, and that's the screaming in pain is what would happen if your body was still alive but dying at the same time. You'd feel the pain of your 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 blood pooling up, your muscles rejecting you, and. That is is a point that I don't think this film gets enough credit for because no other real no other, no other zombie film that really really does that. It's just more like oh you got bit now you're a zombie. It never really goes through like the transition of saying this is what would happen to you if your body slowly turned you into the undead. The, the amount of pain you would be going through as your body literally started to die and reject you while you were still aware of it happening. Um, that, that's pretty awesome. I didn't mention that, but it, it needs to be mentioned. It's not mentioned in many, many, many reviews, but uh, that, that's, that's awesome. Um, no surprise, it's 10 for me, too. I, I, I enjoy the hell out of it. Every time I fucking watch it, I enjoy the hell out of it. There's nothing to say, oh, you know what? I didn't like this part of the movie. E- even the parts with the, 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 with the dickhead colonel guy who's being shitty to his wife. I'll take those parts, too, because they're really minimal. Um... Everything's great. Everything's great in this movie. I, I, I would make the argument, you, you've shown your kids, some, your Victor, some stuff. It's, it's time to show Victor this. It's fine. You know? It's it's not a real vagina. Yeah, it's, it's not a real vagina at the end of the day, there are. It's just the Merkin, okay? <laughs> just don't explain them what the Merkin is. You know? Well, there you go. It's Well, see, um, I, I have it's to away. ask the mama. <laughs> I have to ask the mama first. It's like, <laughs> that's the problem. It's like, come on, it's a pro, it's a prosthetic, okay? Come on, you know. <laughs> it's it's a wig. It's a wig. It's a wig. It's it's a rubber. For your nether regions. It's a, it's a rubbery nether region down there, you know. <laughs> those girls like to use those diva cups now for some disgusting reason, you know. And it, it, that's that's like another merkin for them. So, but merkin on, you know. Oh, I'm done though. But um, <laughs> ten out of ten. Any day of the week, f- f- Sunday through through Saturday, any time of the day, I can turn this on and enjoy the fuck out of it. But um, hell yeah, that's absolutely. the end. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, that's the end of this one. I'm gonna kick it to our brand new segment. This will be the first time you guys ever heard her before, so I'm excited to hear you guys hear her talk about film uh, with my my cousin's child, Alyssa, once again uh, doing house uh, sees it. Hope uh. You guys are with us now. This is a brand new segment that premiered on last show. Uh, that's Dutch just meowing in the background. She, she's not a co-host, but she kind of is. Uh, called House uh, Sees It. And this is, uh, I'll say where I, I asked my uh, cousin's 13-year-old child. Uh, well, she's a, she's a teenager. She's got, you know, stuff going on. But um, what she thinks is films that, that I loved and, and still love. And... Uh, Maybe films she's never seen before. And this time around, we're doing 1995's Tank Girl. Uh, yeah, I was I was a freshman in high school almost when this came out. And uh, she's here today. Alyssa, how you doing, baby? Um, I'm doing pretty good. Cool. Yeah, we'll start this off the same way we always start off. And I'm going to kick off with the trailer. It's the year 2033. There's no law. No mercy. You're gonna really love this one. Bang. And 
no water. There are three million liters of water underneath the blue dunes, and you will retrieve it. The odds of survival are a thousand to one. And that's just the way she likes it. My, my. Talented, isn't she? Hi! Feeling a little inadequate? She'll be fun to break. I like things. Lori Petty. Did I hurt you yet? Ice T. Turn this boat around or you're gonna get us all killed. And Malcolm McDowell. Just how many of my men did you kill? United Artists Pictures presents. Just say, I won. I won. Tank Girl. What's it like knowing you're about to die? You don't! Uh, I'll, I'll let that in post. But uh, yeah, that's a trailer that um, it, it t- t- tells what kind of movies you're going to get. You know, action oriented, loud, rocking soundtrack, but that song is not in the movie. That, that song by a band called Hole is not in the movie. Um, anywho, though, the, your principal players in the film are Lori Petty as Jet. Uh, Naomi Watts as. I mean, um, I messed it up. Lori Petty as Tank Girl. Uh, Naomi Watts plays Jet. Ice T plays T Saint, one of our rippers. Uh, Jeff Colbert as uh, her love interest, uh, slash kangaroo man booga. Uh, Malcolm McDowell as our douchebag uh, water and power head head extraordinaire uh, Kesley. Um, somebody cool shows up because you love Crybaby, right, girl? That movie Crybaby. I do. That's one of my favorite like older movies. Well, un- Uncle Belvedere, uh, Iggy Pop himself, shows up in this movie as the the pervy guy who wants to get with the little girl in the movie. So that, that, that's 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 the this movie. Um, Stacy Lynn Ramsauer, who plays Sam, is uh, the the girl he's after because he's all pervy and such. But um, you say you got a lot more to talk about this movie than the last movie. Um, give us your general thoughts on Tank Girl. Um, it was between the last movie I watched and now this is like a really good movie. Like I would watch it on my own. Like some older movies I wouldn't and I would watch this on my own. I think it's a lot better than the faculty, but that's my thoughts on it. Um, I just think that the character Tank Girl, she was really funny. I liked her in the movie and her and Jet's relationship and how she portrayed like being captured by water and power um at the end of the movie they were sitting there and they were saying that jet was a part of water and power and then like they didn't really explain that that's part like i was confused about if they well, like she, she was she was a, she was a prisoner of them but she was a good mechanic so that they, they used her as a mechanic instead of like working where, where jet where tank was working when she was captured mm-hmm. yeah um, it was, like, I liked it because it was funny, and, like, the way she portrayed being captured, and, like, how she made it fun, like, the movie fun, and it was a lot of adventure, and how she was self-protective over Sam was another good part in the movie I enjoyed. Well, hit us with some favorite parts of the movie, girl. Um, oh, my favorite part is when they got captured by the Rippers, um, and how every, like, the Rippers were, like, they didn't really know if they could trust them or not. And then I liked how um, Tangra and um, Jet, like, kind of were like, they were like, you could trust us, but they, like, were still confused about it. That was, like, my main favorite part. Uh, I liked when they had got Sam, and then I liked when they had all started to work together, and at the end of the movie, when they had, she had uh, killed uh, the dude at the, um, like, the thing for Water and Power. Yeah, it's got a lot of cool action set pieces in this movie. One of which is the scene where she is flying in to 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 stop to, to power and water and power basically the the, the damn uh, parachute scene, you know, fueled by that great soundtrack of this movie. And it was the '90s and the '80s, and you needed a great soundtrack. And this was uh, no exception. A lot, a lot of cool bands contributed to the soundtrack, including a. Uh, Ice T himself, which you know, 
I'm sure. Now, kids, I have to, like, you know, compare stuff that I'm sure she would have seen before, but I'm sure she knows Ice T because she's watched Law and Order Special Victims Unit before. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah. he's on that show for a very long time. And uh, yeah. he shows a movie and uh, claims he has paid a million dollars to play this ro- this role. And I-, I think it was worth every penny to me. And um, what-, what do you think about Lori and Booga? I mean, uh, Lori, Tank Girl and Booga's relationship? Um, well, I thought it was, like, unique, but then I also thought, like, Tank Girl, she was just kind of, like, I don't know, it was, it was weird, but I, like, loved their relationship, because I just thought it was funny, but then also, like, really cute. Yeah, I know you knew this or not, but that, um, Tank Girl is a comic book movie, um, they, they really go further in the books, um, her, her, her and Booger's relationship, and... This movie was supposed to have a um, a sex scene in it where they built a they actually built the kangaroo uh, wang, but it was never used. And um, this this one's really cool too because it um, it has a lady director who worked a lot with with uh, studios called Rachel Rachel Talalay, and um, she worked for New Line Cinema making Freddy movies and stuff. And this is her first big push as a director and. It wasn't crazy successful as far as, uh, you know, making money, but I, I know you love it, and I know I love it, I know I have a lot of friends that love it, and um, uh, anything else that, that you would like to say about the film, you know, that, I don't know, just just lay it out there, girl, you yeah. know. Well, um, there's not much else to say, except the fact that this movie was really enjoyable. I think people my age who like like com- com- like comedy movies like that or like adventure movies like that, they would really enjoy the movie as much as I did. And also like the Rippers, um, I see he was in Law and Order, and I like looked up the cast, and then I had realized that that's who that was, and I was like, well, that's pretty cool because a lot of older movies they don't have any cast or like they don't have any cast that I know or anything that's in anything I watch now. Um, but I really enjoyed the movie overall. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, as as a, a rating, what would you give it 1 to 10? I would do like a 9. Yeah, that's high up, girl. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, you, you might not um, like the next one I have in, in store for you, but I'm, I'm hoping you do. It's one of my all-time favorite things. And it's, it's actually... Um, uh, a comedy this time around. Oh, this had a lot of comedy in it. I'm, uh, I'm gonna dedicate your, your review. So you got to make it good because we we, we lost our our friend Johnny Krug, uh, who was a fellow broadcaster of ours and friend, and he loved a film called Summer School, and I think you're gonna like it too. So uh, no pressure, baby. But th- this one's this one's one for the angels, and he's he's one of the best ones ever. And uh, we're gonna watch Summer School next time. Uh, Starring somebody else you probably know from TV, uh, Mark Harmon, who's the lead guy in NCIS. So you probably watched that show before, too. Uh, yeah, that's what we're doing next. And um, thank you, Sa. Um, any parting words to the listeners? Um, not really. <laughs> <laughs> I would watch it. I, I would watch it. The movie, I, I would watch it. Like, for anybody... If you're over the age of, like, 10, I would watch the movie because I really loved it. Cool, baby. All right, we'll see you all next time, and uh, we'll come back and close out the show. Yeah, guys, so uh, funny things Sud uh, did for her, her second time out, well, as, long, as well as Duchess. Duchess made her voice heard, too, you know. It's, uh, Not bad at all. It's, uh, so, well done. It's something yeah, I decided I like her to... voice. Yeah. She projects her voice very well, so that's she, very good. She's trying, you know. I'm trying to get her to, you know... Open more up about what she watched, and she she's she did better the second time than the first time. So, um, so is she the one that I met? Yeah, you met Alyssa. She she came to the show with us. Oh um, gosh, she is such a little sweetheart. Nah. She was showing where she bought all of her stuff. We walked around for a couple of minutes together. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's Alyssa. She uh, yeah. Somebody decided that they you want to do something, Alyssa, and she she said sure. I was like, well, watch this movie and we'll talk about it. And you know, it, it, it's. I'm gonna throw her some 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 curveballs eventually that she may not like so much, but you know, this is her education, people. And I'm kind of excited to show it to her, and um, 
film she she would never have thought of watching. And uh, I'll kick it to Iris first. Um, thank you again, babe, for coming on. Anything else you'd like to push? And now be the time. Yeah, so, of course, we did uh, Jaws 3 for BBNBC, Badasses, Boobs, and Body Counts. Uh, and you can find that on exploitationfilm.com. The next one that I was on was on we saw the devil.com and that is a true crime podcast. I've been on a couple of episodes. I've one episode I was on as an autopsy technician, which is something I used to do. And the latest episode was we were just like I said talking about the movie Doomsday Mom, which is about Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. And that's pretty much it for now. Suzanne. Oh, you can always find me on the NFW podcast where we are going through another spate of made for TV movies and honestly having a blast doing those. So look for those. The most recent one we did was Tarantula's Cargo of Terror. And the one before that, I think it was just released last week, was the Demon Murder Case. Cool. Yeah, this show, uh, two Jake Minimum commentaries, uh, the brand new Last Call of Torchies, um, Burning for Springwood, those could all be found on the Cinema V feed and the Legion feed, respectively. Uh, Blood from the Core can be found only on Legion Patreon. Go sign up for that. Uh, low, low cost of $2 a month. You can get that. You can get the bonus episode of Last Call of Torches that I've released before this, probably, or on the same day, depending on how ambitious I'm feeling. Uh, <laughs> which we did, we covered the film Drive with Ryan Gosling, which was like a bonus to The Driver, which is a actual Walter Hill film starring Ryan O'Neill and Bruce Stern. If you haven't looked for those, uh, that's a show that we do covering Walter Hill's entire career with Lee Russell and Cameron Scott. Um... Having a great time doing that show, by the way, guys. If you haven't listened to it, um, it's something I'm really proud of. Go go, go check it out. Not that I'm not proud of all, all my projects and all my people. It's just we're having a lot of fun doing it. And if you haven't checked it out, please do so. Um, that's it. I'm leading a lot of ums now, guys. That's, uh, that's about it for this show. Uh, next time, I think X is joining us. And we're going to do a warning sign. And... Uh, what was the other one? Nightmare City, the Umberto Lenzi film. That's more of an infected zombies pair, and I'm looking forward to diving in there with these lovely ladies in, in X, and um, I'm sure I have a lot to say about melting faces and uh, <laughs> Kathleen <laughs> Quinlan screaming about things. It, it could be a really good time. Um, thank you once again for listening. Rate and review us on iTunes. Rate and review all the leading shows on iTunes, please. Uh, and any listening program that you use run all of them apparently including including amazon music and audible and all that bo's got everywhere